Okay, so hi everyone. I'd like to welcome you all again to today's presentation, which is part of our Solution Series webinar. We offer these Solutions webinar, Solution Series webinar as a way to present new products or services to our clients that we truly believe help add value or increase efficiencies in your practice. Our partner today is HIPAA One, the leading provider of automated HIPAA compliance software in the industry. HIPAA One is pleased to present the content for today's webinar, which will highlight their vast experience in dealing with HIPAA audits, as well as providing an overview of their software solution. At the end of the webinar, we're going to tell you how Itenov is partnering with HIPAA One to provide you with a comprehensive solution to your HIPAA risk analysis and compliance challenges. My name is Chelsea Grover, and I'm the Marketing Communications Coordinator for Itenov. I'm going to take a moment to explain how the presentation is going to work. First, I want to mention that this webinar will be recorded, and that we're going to make copies of this recording available next week. Next, for those of you who aren't familiar with Itenov, I wanted to share a bit of who we are with you. We've been in business as Itenov since 2003, but have been next-gen users since 1997, EPM version 2.3. We specialize specifically in next-gen healthcare. Our development team knows how to get data into, out of, and around NextGen to customize it and tailor it to meet our clients' unique needs. It is our passion to provide solutions for our healthcare provider partners, which in turn help them to improve patient care, enhance the patient experience, and maintain a financially healthy practice. Basically, we do everything NextGen, from consulting to hosting to customization and support, and we also have two NextGen add-on productivity solutions, ShareCard and Refund Manager. Next, I'm pleased to mention that next Wednesday, we're going to be presenting an educational webinar on telemedicine, the future of healthcare delivery. I'll be emailing an invitation out for that later today, so check your inboxes for it. Okay, so back to today's presentation. At the end of the webinar, we're going to open the floor up to questions from you. We'll answer all the questions at the end, but you can type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel whenever they occur to you. And for your reference, we're also going to be emailing out links to the recordings of the PDF and the presentation next week, as we do with every webinar. And finally, for audio clarity purposes, everyone's phone is going to remain muted throughout the entire webinar. If you experience audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Chris Floros, Managing Consultant of Security, Com Security and Compliance at Itenip Healthcare Solutions. Bob Siegmiller, Vice President of Business Development with HIPAA One. And Stephen Marco, President and Founder of HIPAA One. Okay, Stephen, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Feel free to get started when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for the kind introduction. Uh, this is Steve Marco, President and Founder of HIPAA One, and I'm very, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for joining uh, Itentive and HIPAA One today to help provide some information on how to survive the HIPAA audit, and uh, we uh, will announce more about how our collaboration uh, in uh, towards the end of the webinar. Today's agenda, from a audit perspective, we understand that uh, we want to cover uh, some of the HIPAA basics and the benefits. Uh, this is going to be a different type of approach to how uh, HIPAA is covered. So we're going to go through a 30,000 foot level and then drop down into the risk analysis and what type of documentation is required. We're going to go into the risk management methodology, which is the uh, NIST special publications, um, which is the endorsed methodology uh, on how to calculate risk within the organization. We'll also, we're also going to cover what the difference is uh, between a mock audit, assessment, and risk analysis. If you uh, are already being audited, you're probably going to be able to walk the walk in terms of how to prepare for the audit after it's done. We want to definitely help provide that information so you can be proactive and in the event that the audit does, does happen or any other type of incident that we will be prepared, as well as there's been a recent update for the Office for Civil Rights, which as we all know, they are the official enforcers of HIPAA, or otherwise dubbed the HIPAA police. They just went, uh, they're, they are constantly evolving their, their, their processes to help reduce fraud, waste, and abuse, reduce the chances of a breach, and to help clinics and other covered entities uh, identify issues uh, before they become problems. So uh, with, uh, without further ado, uh, we've um, had the opportunity to work with Itentive, uh, they, with, with the managed service providers and their tenure uh, within health information technology, uh, we are um, dovetailed nicely to ensure that, that we can provide full coverage and, and, and expertise to ensure that, that you're ready for, uh, for whatever comes your way in terms of, of, of any type of proving of HIPAA compliance as well as risk management. 
Uh, so quick introduction, quick introduction to HIPAA-1 uh, in case we haven't uh, been introduced before. Uh, we do focus on healthcare compliance and risk management. Uh, we are constantly improving the, the, the um, process, people and technology as we uh, go through and continue to emanate. Uh, thankful to partners like Itentive. Uh, our software uh, was released in September of 2012, and we are uh, enjoy we are now have over 2,400 sites that are using HIPAA One to manage risk and manage compliance. We focus on automation for anything that could pass anything that's repetitive and manual and, and error prone. We do focus on on automation. We've also just released a privacy and breach notification um, solution as well. Uh, that can be offered through Itentive as well. Everything is developed and maintained here in the United States. Uh, everything we use um, uh, programmers here in Utah. We have our data centers uh, uh, between California and uh, Virginia uh, with, with redundancy and, and everything is we are constantly running vulnerability scans and we do annual penetration testing to ensure that the platform is actually secure. Quick disclaimer, there's no substitute for good legal advice, uh, but we are auditors and must understand HIPAA. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the program. Uh, so sometimes running an organization, regardless of the size or the breadth, can sometimes feel like being a gameskeeper here at a national park in, in West Africa. Uh, and uh, being that gameskeeper, you need to know a few things about how to survive uh, to continue uh, to do your job and, and, and be able to live another day. Uh, what we want to do is go through some processes today uh, in understanding what the, you know, what, the, what the requirements are as well as what the threats are, more importantly, uh, to the organization. So the threats here for this gameskeeper with the hippopotamus is fairly apparent. The first one is no, there's a num hippopotamus is number one killer of human beings by wildlife every year in Africa. They weigh about 5,500 pounds. They can run up to 21 miles per hour only over short distances. Males will charge to protect their territory. Females will charge to protect their young. It, knowing all of these elements, uh, the gameskeeper uh, started running full stride by the time the hippo jumped out of the ditch to charge. Uh, the gameskeeper was already far enough away knowing all of those rules um, and, and how to survive another day uh, was, was able to get away uh, unscathed. And, and, and that's really what we want to cover today. And by the way, if anyone on the call today says that we are comparing the hippopotamus to the Office for Civil Rights, that's not the case. That's, that's not what we're trying to do. On a light note, uh, because HIPAA can sometimes be a dark and dreary area sometimes, uh, we wanted to introduce Pat. Uh, this is our mascot. We're not sure if Pat's a boy or a girl, as you can tell by the strategically placed stethoscope. Uh, but uh, Pat does, um, in addition to providing some light into the other, otherwise sometimes dark and dreary world of HIPAA's uh, compliance and security and privacy, uh, Pat does also stand for physical, administrative, and technical safeguards, which have to be tested as part of the risk analysis. So why are we here today? Well, we want to understand what, the, what we have to do in order to prepare for an audit. So let's first talk about how you can be audited because you know, it's not like they're walking around door to door um, auditing, but, uh, but we're getting there. There are five ways to get audited. Probably the most common way is through a patient complaint or whistleblower. There's roughly 1,700 patient complaints that are issued on the Health and Human Services website every month. Uh, the overall trend is going down. Uh, however, uh, that is still a very high way to get audited. That's why it's number one on our list here. So the Office for Civil Rights is legally required to investigate every patient complaint. So if you're a health plan and you have a member who's not happy or if you're a health care provider you have a patient who's not happy, uh, they can literally go online to Health and Human Services, complain about uh, any privacy, security, or breach of practices, and, and that will result in an audit. Uh, OCR will jump in and audit based on the circumstances around the complaint. The second would be breach notice. So any breaches over 500 have to be notified to Health and Human Services within 60 days. It, and if there are smaller, um, there are some circumstances of smaller breaches depending on the, uh, on the threat, uh, likelihood of harm to the individuals. Uh, for example, there is a um, um, uh, elderly care service up in North Idaho that was uh, they're the first. Uh, they're the first 
um, covered entity to be uh, fined for under uh, 500 of a um, breach. And uh, that, 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 that shows that, that it's not only over 500, but we have to be concerned with the circumstances around how that breach happens. So you're legally required to notify Health and Human Services and based on the risk of harm, based on a number um, of individuals, there are certain rules around what you need to do in order to notify those individuals. So that's the number two way to get, to get audited. Number three, uh, this actually should probably be up in the number two spot. Uh, for those recipients of meaningful use, uh, some state Medicaid programs require annual security risk analysis as well. Uh, Arizona and California, namely, we have quite a few clients uh, that deal with the Medicaid distributions in those states. And uh, that, uh, that in addition to meaningful use, uh, there's a core measure to protect EPHI as we moved from paper charting to electronic charting uh, the, 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 um, the likelihood and the impact of, of a hacking attack is, uh, is, 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 is much higher. So uh, not only that, but to receive those, those federal dollars and state-issued dollars, uh, we need to do annual risk analysis to make sure that, that, that we're safeguarding uh, that electronic protected health information. The number four way is uh, random audits. So last year we heard of quite a few organizations being contacted by Newman Research. Uh, there's also emails that went out last year as well to a number of covered entities to verify the primary contact information. And in July of this year, 167 letters went out to covered entities and business associates as well, uh, asking for not one but two copies of the HIPAA security risk analysis. So they want to see that not only the risk analysis was done, but that there's two of them and that there's, and, and that there's progress being made between them. Also a small set of privacy and breach requirements. Not all of them, but, but uh, some subsets uh, dealing with um, patient right to access and a breach in terms of having the risk assessment process in place to determine A, if a breach happened, B, what the likelihood of, 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 of harm is, and C, what the notification requirements are. Uh, so that's a fairly high, high chance. And then finally, business associates, we're seeing a higher number of, of breaches that are caused by business associates, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump into that here in just a moment. Before we jump into business associates and an example of, of each of these, this is the part of the audit webinar where people will start talking about HIPAA, HIPAA being enacted back in 1996 by Congress. But, but let's, let's take a higher level overview, regulatory compliance. There's all these compliance requirements. So HIPAA is what we're talking about today, Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, in short, that is a set of laws not only to protect the patient rights, but it's also to move towards a standardized, centralized healthcare system. We'll look at that in just a moment. And to give you a couple other examples of what regulatory compliance is, just to give context, Sarbanes-Oxley, for those that are on the call that have any publicly traded entities, those financial reports, the accuracy and the timeliness, uh, those are all the controls under Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which uh, ensure integrity of those reports around the financial system and, and more importantly, the reporting to shareholders uh, for um, integrity purposes. Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, this is more for banks and financial institutions to ensure what happened to Wells Fargo uh, over the past year and a half doesn't happen, where you can transfer money without the authorization of the individual, of the account holder, or the financial uh, account holder, so they were actually already fined, 100, I think it was $118 million, which in the grand scheme of things is not much for Wells Fargo, however, obviously in conjunction with the um, public uh, PR that they have to manage, uh, there's obvious reasons there that would also affect healthcare in the event of a breach, but uh, that's Graham Leach and Biley Act to ensure that, that, that those things don't happen. And then of course the payment card industry, which is a very black and white, uh, you know, very, you either are or you're not compliant, here's the, here's the checklist of items around the technical uh, elements uh, and some change management around the uh, credit card uh, processing uh, environment. So uh, there's many others, but just to give you an idea, this is where HIPAA fits in. One, uh, there's many commonalities with these, with, uh, with most regulatory compliance. These four, all of them are here to help reduce fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, and and HIPAA is unique in a way that we'll release here in just a moment, just a moment. So again, we don't want to go into the whole details of how HIPAA works. But basically, here's an idea of all the different components that, that actually comprise of the act itself. 
uh, standard code sets, transactions, fraud, waste, and abuse. You know, the, um, there's a lot of potential for fraud, waste, and abuse when you submit your claim and you get money. Uh, so uh, um, Jocelyn Samuels back in 2013 announced that for every dollar they spent on enforcement for fraud, waste, and abuse, they were getting $7.93 back. So um, anyways, not to, divul uh, not to diverge too much from our focus, we definitely want to focus on privacy and security. By the way, breach notification as part of the High Tech Act is part of privacy. So this is the area that we're going to focus on today. We're going to laser focus on, on security. So, what it, so now that we've gone through HIPAA, by the way, HIPAA is a rule book. It's, it's literally uh, paragraphs and paragraphs of rules of what needs to happen. So how do we select the rules that, we're, that, that apply to us? Because most of us on the call don't actually want to become HIPAA experts. We just want to know quick, straightforward, how do we have a good foundation for compliance? How do we prepare for the audit? So this is how the audit, um, the Office for Civil Rights selects their audit protocol. The 72 number here in the green area, we actually prepared this uh, donut here just to quickly uh, provide a visual graphic as to what is involved uh, with, the, with, with the audit protocol. So each of these numbers represents a HIPAA citation. So that's a paragraph from the HIPAA rulebook. There are 72 of those HIPAA citations that are selected for security. That's the green area. Security deals with electronic safeguards, physical, administrative, and technical safeguards, we, and, and it deals with the electronic protected health information. And the goals, the underlying objectives, are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we'll jump into a few examples of those three elements here in just a moment. The, uh, just for reference, the, the red and the blue areas deal with privacy and breach, respectively. So these are the HIPAA citations that are selected. Uh, and with each one of these HIPAA citations, there's individual lines of instructions that it's not only, well, here's the HIPAA citation, it's very vague. In order to prove compliance, the OCR just released in April of this year updates on the OCR audit protocol. So they've actually been very prescriptive in their latest update of the audit protocol. And it's very important to note that any solution that you use this year needs to be updated with the updated OCR audit protocol because, as we all know, the Office for Civil Rights that is the standard for HIPAA compliance. It's not high trust as, um, as much as they're trying. Uh, it is the federal government, it's Office for Civil Rights. So this is the Bible, so to speak, in terms of, of what needs to happen uh, for that uh, protected health information. So now let's jump into briefly, what is an assessment? So an assessment is basically a checklist, yes or no. Are we compliant with something or not? If we are, if, if we, so let's, Let's just take an example. Policy and procedure for worker sanctions. There's a HIPAA citation that says the organization will have a policy and procedure so that if any member of the workforce uh, violates any code of conduct of the organization or any HIPAA uh, rules, that there will be a tiered sanction level applied for the level of, of, of the violation. So an example would be a, a member of the workforce emailing um, patient lists or health information to a you know, public personal email account. It's unencrypted, it's unsecured, there's no way to verify that it was received, there's no way to encrypt it. Uh, so that's a violation that would require training, HIPAA training. So that's an example. So if we're compliant, the old audit protocol up until March of this year would just ask for that policy and procedure. But this year, they're not only asking for the policy and procedure, they actually want to see an example, at least one example of a workforce member that has, has, has been sanctioned based on that policy. So this is the mock audit component. Okay, so the assessment is are we compliant or not? The mock audit is proving that we're compliant. So we need to have the policy and procedure, it needs to be reviewed or updated in the past few years. And we have an example of that of that of, of that workforce member. Um, you know, we can redact the name, but we have to prove it. So that's the mock audit component and that's required under the new audit protocol. What happens if the mock audit does not pass muster? Well, then we have to do this thing called a risk analysis. So the risk analysis, think of it as jumping into the weeds. We have a gap in compliance. Now we have to determine, is this a high, medium, or low risk to the organization? Do we need to address it immediately? Can we wait for 60 days? You know, give us an idea. So there's a uh, risk management process at a high level overview. You have to identify what threat, what threat you're concerned with. If we go back to our policy and procedure example, 
workforce member, um, and and uh, it's it's called vicarious liability. So the organization is vicariously liable for the actions of the workforce member. Um, so that's the threat, one of the few threats. The next is what's the vulnerability? Well, we've never actually, you know, being in business 15 years, we've never actually used the sanction policy for anything. Well, that's pretty hard to believe that someone hasn't violated something to do with HIPAA in this day and age of electronic health exchange. So, um, so, so that's our vulnerability. What's the likelihood that this vulnerability will manifest itself into the threat of a of a of a lawsuit or or a loss of EPHI? It's pretty high. What's the impact of the organization? Well, it's pretty high, especially if you have to notify the individual that the information has been lost. Uh, so the risk is also high. Uh, that's one example of how to calculate risk. The next step that we've calculated risk is to determine what the remediation plan item, task, and activity is going to be. What who's going to do what by when? That has to be documented as well. So and that's one example. There's there there's there's those 72 HIPAA rules. So uh, this is, this needs to be done for every one every one of those elements: the assessment, the mock audit, and the risk analysis for those elements that don't that don't pass mustard. All of these have to be documented in a in a in a in a useful fashion for the audit that 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 will happen. So this is the keystone of any risk management. Um, program is a risk analysis for this reason, as well as being able to respond to an audit. Okay, earlier we talked briefly, and, and now I'm just going to briefly uh, run through this business associate. So one of the big changes with the OCR's audit protocol is the requirement not only to have a business associate agreement signed, but also to have this to have additional satisfactory assurances. So it could be asking for proof of a HIPAA training for all the workforce. Show me policies and procedures that you know how to deal with a breach, or you know how to deal with if one of our patients goes to your organization asking for their information, that you'll submit that back to us. Understanding, so, so more than just a business um, associate agreement. As you exchange information, this could be a hosting provider, could be a portal, it could be a data center, it could be any one of these, it could be a service provider. As that information gets exchanged, here's the reason why it's important to get those additional um, elements. If a business associate or one of their lower tier subcontractors were to be hacked, they would notify the up tier business associate until eventually that business associate that's working for you will let you know. It's up to you to notify, oops, it's up to you to notify uh, the individuals and to notify Health and Human Services. So the business associate agreement, all it does is just clearly state that everyone knows what their responsibilities are. You could put additional instruments into your business associate agreement that if the breach is of, is of the business associate's fault, that they will cover notification expenses, maybe uh, identity theft protection expenses as well. But that's a whole discussion. That's another. There's three. There's three areas that we cover within business associates. Now there's a fourth to ensure that we also have, um, you know, to meet the OCR's requirements, but also for your protection to ensure that, that your business associates and business associates also make sure that their subcontractors are also following the same requirements that we all are. By the way, uh, if you would like a case study, look up Bizmatix. Bizmatix is an EHR hosting provider that had, a, that had this exact same scenario happen, and there's every month you're hearing about a new clinic that has to notify their patients of that breach, even though of no fault of their own, the breach actually happened. So uh, just a heads up, this is very important. Always ask any portals if you're using a cloud-based EHR, ask for those assurances that they're actually uh, being compliant. So just to recap, in a breach, it is a covered entity who reports, even if the fault is on behalf of the business associate. And who pays? Normally, normally, under the most business associate agreements, it's under the it's the covered entity's responsible responsibility to pay for those. They also, in in most cases, the covered entity prefers to manage the messaging to those patients as opposed to the business associate because they have the primary care relationship. So uh, that's just a heads up on 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 as we go into the age of of electronic health records and, and open exchange that we need to be uh, ready for these things. So quick recap, you want to perform a comprehensive HIPAA security risk analysis, make sure you, you know where your EPHI is and then include those in the risk analysis. Uh, as you go through and complete the snapshot, so to speak, we want, we're, we're going to find gaps in compliance, make sure we have plans to remediate those, those deficiencies. And just for the record, we want to 
clarify the difference between compliance and security because those terms are, are interchanged quite often. HIPAA security is, is, the, is, is the pursuit of the objectives for confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data CIA. Uh, where, you know, to make sure the hackers don't get in, make sure that the data is clean, it has integrity, people aren't editing it without being logged and without having minimal access to that information, that we can restore the data in case of a ransomware attack, uh, that we can, we can restore the data without having to um, notify that. By the way, quick note on ransomware, for those that are wondering if a ransomware is a breach or not, uh, the short answer is, in the event that the ransomware, um, the ransomware attack encrypted Patient data, uh, legally speaking, that data is now in control of someone trying to conduct fraud, someone that's extorting you to, to pay money. So legally speaking, you've lost control of that EPHI, and that's the trigger that it is actually a breach uh, under the uh, Office for Civil Rights Guidance that was released last month. Uh, if they did not encrypt, if you're able to stop it uh, before any EPHI was encrypted, it's not considered a breach, but you certainly need to beef up your layered security to stop that from happening. HIPAA compliance is actually showing the intent that you're maintaining your documentation and that you have proof that you have the intent to actually meet the requirements of the HIPAA security rules. So it's important to know the difference between those two. If you ever have trouble sleeping at night, the Office for Civil Rights has guidance on risk analysis. They point to uh, NIST 800-30 as the only endorsed methodology for the risk analysis portion. They talk about assessment and the mock audit components. Um, we're not going to go into this too far here because we want to focus on HIPAA security, but this is a monumental year as the Meaningful Use Incentive Program comes to a close and we move towards a, um, well, if you're going to use the carrot and stick analogy, uh, we're, we're moving from the incentives uh, to the ongoing uh, reimbursement programs, failure to do risk analysis under the new macro program, whether you're going on the MIPS track uh, or, or you're going APM track, uh, these, these new uh, quality of payment program does require annual risk analysis simply to help, again, reduce the chance of breaches and to reduce the chances of uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, so that is going to affect 3 to 9% of reimbursements. Uh, just a quick review if, for, you know, we kind of been dropping these throughout the um, webinar, but uh, all the protocols, again, have been updated in, in April of this year. There's more policies and procedures required. For example, they used to require just proof that you're doing logging and that, and that you're doing a, a review process to, for suspicious activity, which could include a high number of failed login attempts. Now they want to see that plus a proof that it's actually being done and they want the policy and procedure that this will happen. Again, policies and procedures, remember, they, they, they show the intent of the, of the executive team, of the management, upper management, that we're going to follow these requirements. We work with many clinics and clients that are either doing the right thing at the, at the operation level, but there's no policies and procedures. In other areas, we'll see that there's policies and procedures, but no one's really adhering to them. So make sure that the policies and procedures meet the code of conduct of how you want your organization to treat your members, your patients, your, your staff, your workforce, how workforce is expected to, um, to treat everyone. So uh, again, HIPAA, HIPAA um, we're finding that when organizations embrace a basic HIPAA protocol, it's really a set of best practices and actually morale goes up because people are very clear on what their boundaries limitations are and what's expected of them. So there's a lot of benefits to employing HIPAA above and beyond, you know, the proverbial uh, uh, a Grim Reaper audit uh, that, you know, that everyone's, everyone's concerned with. It should be a side benefit of, 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 of embracing the program, not, not a um, mandatory. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. So uh, they're asking for, uh, we have talked about the uh, demonstration of proof of, of these things actually happening. Uh, the um, business associate agreements, uh, plan sponsors for group health plans only for um, uh, need to show that, that, that they also have satisfactory um, assurances. The easiest way is just to say, hey, have you done HIPAA security risk analysis? If not, uh, just refer them to Itentive and, and we'll get that taken care of as, as quickly as possible. Privacy, we've seen a big emphasis uh, to help ensure minimum necessary exchanges between covered entities. Again, if you have a patient or a member that needs their access, the default should always be to grant it, document it, but when exchanging between covered entities, try and limit 
the information for what's needed uh, for the treatment payment or healthcare operations. For breach, they want to, they've added on uh, nine elements uh, from the old audit protocol, uh, and that's for training, uh, so that a, a, a um, that everyone knows how to handle complaints, how to how to handle um, you know incidents, and 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 that the person that's in charge of actually doing the risk assessment on those incidents knows how to calculate risk of harm and and to determine if a breach actually happened. So we've counted. Uh, over 1,654, those are individual, either complete sentences or bulleted sentences that are requiring changes. Ensure the software is updated. So whatever solution you use, if you're using spreadsheets or the government's SRA tool, those are obsolete now because the OCR has updated their auto protocol. Anyone you use, make sure that we're updated. HIPAA 1 has been updated as of June. We're the first in the industry, very proud to say, that has updated our software. Well, if you're using a software program that claims to be compliant with current regulatory mandates, it should be. So we are. Uh, real quick, um, we're just going to, we're about to switch over. Bobby Siegmiller is going to help you uh, visualize the concept of the risk analysis, how it's done through iTentive using HIPAA 1 software. Uh, it's broken down into three steps. The first step is to gather the information. iTentive will make sure that that information has uh, full integrity, reviewing your policies, procedures, any notes. The software will um, calculate a standard remediation plan, as well as uh, once the remediation planning is done, we've assigned tasks and activities, who's going to do what by when. We can sign, add reviewers. The software will do a weekly reminder for each user with a, a digest of what, of what items they have that are either coming due or past due. We also have integrated uh, e-signatures to mark the end of the snapshot and the, the software Bobby will show you how you can use it for ongoing remediation and collaboration. Bobby, would you be so kind? Absolutely. Thank you, Steve, so much. Um, virtual raise of hands. You know, I, I'm interested to see those of you that joined the healthcare uh, group thought when they started in healthcare, I love HIPAA. I can't wait to comply with all these new HIPAA requirements. Um, if, if you're still raising your hand, I want you to kind of smack yourself on the back of the head you know, with that same hand. You know, th there's a lot to know and a lot to do, and I think that's why you're very fortunate uh, to be working with ITANA. They've got a group uh, that, that is very familiar with what you need to do so you can focus on your own business. They'll help you navigate through this risk assessment process utilizing the HIPAA one software. So it, it's a very good partnership there and will bring back some sanity into your life taking this off your plate and putting it on theirs. Uh, one of the first things we do, we log into, an, into a secure environment with the HIP1 software. All of these stakeholders are identified. So the view that we're looking at right now on the screen, this is the uh, sponsor view. So they can see HR director 100% complete with their uh, questions. IT network manager, server manager, you can tell the percentage. HIPAA security officer, we've got a problem. Uh, they haven't even started their questions. You can see uh, there on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. So this gives us a good uh, just graphical representation of where the individuals are. This screen I'm showing you here uh, has the regulatory text or the citation on the top right in gray. So again, if you're having challenges uh, sleeping or uh, boredom, and you want to read the regulatory text, there you go. The interpretation on the left-hand side is, is our verbiage, uh, and it very simply is asking for a policy and procedure. Um, we've talked about the HIPAA 1 software being a TurboTax-like approach to completing a risk assessment. So very simply it asks, do you have a policy and procedure for worker sanctions? And you have the option of yes or no. Uh, if I click on yes, it's going to prompt me to upload supporting documentation and it's going to say upload something that's been uh, uploaded within the past three years. If I click on no, it will tee up that document for you so you're not having to scramble and, and wonder. Um, just so you know, this is one of the areas that the OCR is looking for. Steve mentioned this earlier in the call. When he talked about two assessment, I just want to clarify, uh, one of our clients, and again, we are 100% pass rate with the OCR, Figliozzi, all that are uh, requesting this documentation from our clients. But they're asking for last year's assessment, so 2014, this year's assessment, 2015, you know, if it were 2015, 
and they want to identify what gaps did you find? What is your corrective action plan? What's your plan to remediate some of these items? And then they want a list of all your business associates as well. So this software really helps you navigate through that process. Uh, the threat matrix on the screen here, if you were to do this on your own, you know, one of the questions we always hear is, hey, are we required to use a third party or a software to do this? And the answer is no. Um, but to that I say, it's like digging a foundation for your home. Could you do that with a shovel? Absolutely. But why wouldn't you hire that out to an excavator with a backhoe that has the experience and that's going to get the depth perfect and uh, lay a very solid foundation? That's what we're proposing this HIP1 software will do. This threat matrix, every question that you answer runs through this threat matrix of likelihood times impact equals risk. So you now have a working list of some of these high-risk items that need to be identified, especially gaping holes uh, that would be hackers or areas that you could be vulnerable. Um, this is going to identify that. And then our team at Itenev will help with some of those IT-related things that need to be done. So you've got a great team behind you helping you with that. The screen we're seeing uh, now is all green, green is go, everybody's responded to their questions, uploaded supporting documentation, and we can now move forward. Um, this is an example once we get to the remediation section. So Steve had shown us those three different areas. One is the information gathering phase. This is now the second step, remediation. A lot of our smaller clients love this feature. They can click on this edit feature and it'll drop you into the risk. What you'll notice is a lot of this information is already auto-populated, so we know the risk. It's high. There's the threat, you know, external cyber, cyber crime, vulnerability. You now just simply need to add some compensating controls, assign an individual uh, to this risk, and a target date that it's going to be completed by, and then it will ping them every week. It'll send them an email and say, hey, these are your four items that have got to be completed. And the nice thing about it, that little action plan you see there, it's all that they need to know is included in there already. So if you want to customize that and add additional verbiage, you're welcome to do so. But this is the best practice. Uh, Steve mentioned, you know, we've got thousands of, of client sites, but we've got about 20 to 30,000 data points in the software. And so we have implemented these best practices for you as an organization. This screen will show us, uh, at a glance, graphical representation of where we are as an organization. So on the left-hand side, that is our current risk status. So it'll stack those unaddressed, opened, and resolved. Now, a lot of time, we will have a physician that wasn't really part of the risk assessment process, but wants to know, as an organization, where am I? And, and on the left-hand side, they can see that at a glance. We have this many high-risk items. The right-hand side is going to show the progress or the updates that your organization has done over time. So those are very, very nice dashboards just very quickly that we can see uh, where we are. Now, the report. This, this is an interesting uh, thing. In the HIPAA and software, this is the collaborative uh, energies and efforts aggregated into a single report. Just to write this report would take you weeks to uh, compile all this information. Our software does it in about three to four seconds. It's perfect every single time. So you have a table of contents that will go through. These are all links that will go through to the different sections, the introduction, the scope, the methodology we follow. Um, it, it will you know, give you everything you need to respond to an audit. So a couple quick tips that we want to counsel. We see a lot of our smaller practices, for whatever reason, they're embarrassed to answer no to some of these questions. Do you have a policy and procedure for worker sanctions? Uh, we do. It's five years old. They're asking for three years old. Let's just answer yes, that we have it, and then we'll fix that later. Our recommendation, please do not answer yes to anything that you don't have, and here's why. First is, uh, if they call you on the carpet and you can't provide that supporting documentation, immediate fail of your audit. The second is, it's almost better, even if you have a policy that's 90% complete, to answer no, and then finish it up and load it in there, and then what it's doing is making your action history. Look at all the items that we have completed. We take HIPAA compliance so seriously, we love it. 
and, and look at this list grow. So you'll have 10, 15, 20 remediation items that were very, very easy to knock out. And that's really what they want to see. They want to see that snapshot in time. That's the risk assessment. And then the moving picture is what you're doing about those gaps. So that's the first piece of counsel there. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, and again, we just talked about this pressure to remediate during the, the uh, assessment. Again, just get it done. Get, get that snapshot completed. Um, let's see. Uh, click yes or no button for more information. So there, there are tutorials throughout the software. If you don't understand what is being asked of throughout the software, uh, we'll point that out for you. Uh, we'll point that out to you in the software. So that is uh, the conclusion. Again, if you have any questions, we can go through a very detailed overview. Wanted to give you a quick, you know, seven to ten minute overview of the software and what it entails. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, to bring it home, uh, Chris Flores will take over. Great. Thanks, Steve and Bobby, for that great information on how important a complete security risk assessment is to the HIPAA compliance of an organization. ITENA brings you these partner series webinars to highlight services which present significant value to the organizations we work with. In reviewing the landscape of audits, we're seeing that 20 to 25 percent of organizations failing audits with the number one reason being an inadequate risk assessment. This quoted statistic has really been borne out in our work with our own customers who have been diligently completing their own internal risk assessments. But on closer inspection, we discovered that many assessments didn't cover the almost 80 points that HHS expects to be addressed in a complete security risk assessment. We've also identified customers that had policies and procedures in place, but didn't have any evidence or artifacts to demonstrate or prove that they were following these policies and procedures. Um, the practices really hadn't adopted that audit mentality that we were talking about earlier in the presentation of their compliance program. You know, it's one thing to have these policies and procedures in the book but quite another to be able to prove their implementation in the face of an audit and an audit's really rapid 10, you know, 10 business day to respond timeline that really stresses any compliance program to its limits. At Itenev, we incorporate the HIPAA One solution to help our customers achieve a complete end-to-end -end solution for risk ass assessment through remediation. You know, one of the things we try to drive home to our customers is that HIPAA compliance, it isn't a one-time check the box event and be finished. You know, identifying and remediating risks is a continuous process that must be undertaken to become HIPAA compliant, and more importantly, to do everything possible to prevent the data breach and safeguard our patients' data. At the end of the day, right, the government mandate is really to take all the steps necessary to protect the EPHI. So ITENF can really help you through performing a thorough and accurate security risk analysis and remediation plan. We'll help you manage the process and guide you step-by-step -step through the entire process. Obviously, our methodology leverages the proven and tested HIPAA One software and includes a copy and set of compliance questions and access repository for maintaining the interviews responses, supporting documentation, and remediation action plan. And that really is key. Being able to have this information at your fingertips if you're asked for it is really a huge benefit to the, the practices that we work with. In addition, it really forces us to kind of get into the mindset that we not only have to have these policies and procedures, we really have to do them on a regular basis. So in the process of going through this, we'll go through this with you, review your interview responses, all the supporting materials, and identify any areas which need additional information or clarification. Some of the questions, while they're pretty, they're pretty clear, every practice is a different set of, 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 of applications. And sometimes there's a question to say, how does this question really relate to, um, to our practice? That's something that we can have our analysts be online to be able to help you through that process. Once we've answered these questions, we can help identify all the threats and vulnerabilities and analyze any controls that are in place. Once we've done that, we can help you develop a remediation plan, which is going to be required by OCR if they ever come through an audit, to be able to be a, prioritize those risks by likelihood and impact and show that you're actually along your path of being able to remediate those risks. Once that's done, we also help you track and document this ongoing remediation effort throughout the whole year. And then finally, we're available to help you be a resource to answer any HIPAA or meaningful use questions that come up throughout the year. A lot of times we'll be implementing additional software or be able to change things and have questions about how this impacts our, uh, our risk assessment plan or how, how it, it affects our HIPAA compliance. We can certainly help you through that process. Um, I appreciate everybody's time on the, on the, the webinar. We uh, are going to open up the questions. My information is up here as uh, a managing consultant for security and compliance at Attendant Solutions. 
Uh, my email address and phone number are here. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or any further information that, that you need. We're going to include a link to our online quick security quiz for uh, HIPAA compliance when we send out the webinar invite, and I invite you all to take a few minutes to go through and complete that. It'll give you guys a report to show kind of some of the more key areas and how you're looking in those different compliance areas. At that okay. point, I think we can open up to questions for Chelsea. Yep, thank you all. Uh, thanks guys for the great information. And as a reminder, you can type your questions in the webinar control panel, uh, which is probably on the right side of your screen. And you can type them in and I'll read them aloud in the order that they come. Uh, so the first question we have, uh, we weren't randomly selected for phase two audits. Are we okay? So, uh, Chelsea, I can, I can take that. This is Bobby. You know, it's interesting. We just spoke with one of our clients. Uh, this was about a week and a half ago. They were randomly selected. It was kind of funny. She said, I, I couldn't win the lottery if I wanted to. And here I am, our small organization is being <laughs> you know, selected for this audit. Um, uh, we had a good call with her. She shared that they had two one-hour calls with the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we also have the list of what they are requiring. We've shared a little bit about that on the call, but my, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like the uh, the boogeyman is coming or implement fear here, but I will tell you the reality of what's being created. There's a portal that the OCR is creating. These 167 that were selected will submit their last year's and this year's risk assessment in addition to uh, gaps that were identified, uh, their remediation plan, and a list of business associates. They will submit that through the portal. Of those that can't produce that documentation, uh, they will now go into a bucket or a pool of individuals that will actually be audited. And that's only one way to be audited by OCR. Steve mentioned several of the other ways uh, that you could be audited. But uh, the, what scares me here is you have 10 days to respond. So if you haven't started a risk assessment, uh, or, or you may have done a risk assessment, but uh, you know, Chris had mentioned this a little earlier. Our statistic uh, from the OCR when I was back in Washington, I met with uh, Laura, who created you know the SRAP tool that's now obsolete. She said that 68% of people were failing their audits because of the risk assessment, and it wasn't because they weren't doing it; it was done incorrectly. So something that we want to shed a light on issue this warning, and again, not, <laughs> not trying to scare anyone uh, into doing it, but it is required, and, and I believe we are going to see a lot more of these fines. Each of the fines are about $50,000 per infraction, but lucky for us, they only cap at a million and a half, so uh, that's a lot of money. So my suggestion it would be to spend the you know few thousand bucks to get this done and use it as an insurance policy, and, and really also to secure uh, your organization. Compliance is a very, very low bar and, and we can help check that box, but security is quite another and that's where I tend of can really provide some assistance to you guys so that you can sleep at night and again focus on growing your business. So uh, there's a long answer to a short question. Hey, if I may add also that the um, the end result was happy. Uh, they did use HIPAA 1 to, re to respond to that audit. This is Steve Marco. And it, the software, uh, you know, you do the risk analysis and then a year goes by, two years goes by, you don't think anything about it, but then when the audit happens, it's almost like a, a moment of panic. Where is it? Do we have it? Where's your Excel spreadsheet? Where's the PDF that the consulting firm left? How do we show that we've done progress on these remediation items? You literally go, log into HIPAA 1, go to the final report page, any updates are automatically included in the final appendix of the report. Click the print button, you've got the PDF send it and you're done. So uh, just a quick uh, happy note on the end of that <laughs> of that uh, situation there, Bobby just wanted to mention that as well. So um, yeah, it was a, definitely a happy ending in this case. Thanks guys. Uh, next question. Do you supply sample policies and procedures? Yes, all, all are included in the software. So that's, that's the beauty. If there's a question uh, that is requiring a policy, the software will ask you, do you have this, yes or no? And if you say yes, we're going to say, prove it. Upload supporting documentation that's been updated within the last three years. If you say no, we give that to you for free. Um, I just talked, we're out of Utah, but I talked to one of our sales partners in uh, Tennessee yesterday, 
and she said there are groups purchasing these libraries for fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars, and they implement a bunch of policies and procedures, and then they adhere to about half of them. That is a bad idea. <laughs> so we give you exactly what you need throughout the software, and there is no fee for that. Matter of fact, your assessment oftentimes is is cheaper doing it, uh, you know, with the software than to go buy a policy and procedure library, a vulnerability scan. It all comes with it. Great question. Just to add on also, one of the things that Bobby said earlier, not being afraid to, to answer no to some of these questions, that's another great reason to not be afraid to answer no is because if you do answer no, you can see what, what, what an acceptable policy looks like and decide if that's something you want to adopt. And, and you know what, to, to chime in also, HIPAA is the only regulatory mandate that allows you to be out of compliance. As long as A, you've detected that you're out of compliance, and B, you have a plan in place, and C, you're implementing that plan as reasonable and appropriate. So that's a very good point. Thanks, guys. Uh, okay, next question. Who reviews our policies and procedures when they're uploaded, once they're uploaded? Depending on, this is Bobby, depending on what uh, package they elect to use with HIPAA 1, there is a self-assessment mode. There's also uh, a remote option and an on-site option for those that are larger. But we understand uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the groups we've been speaking with are single doc practices with uh, a wife as an office manager. You know, they're very small and don't have the budget for well, on-site. We don't recommend that. But um, uh, what is important is that, oh, Steve, did you have something to say? Wife or 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 husband. Just wanted to put that out there. Sorry, sorry, Bobby. Interrupts. Want to make Thank sure. Thank you for the clarification, boys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't want anyone to feel discriminated against. Um, but but yes, everything uh, as part of the software is included, and depending on what level, those can be reviewed. Now, those doing a self-assessment, this has been tried and true, uh, you know, proven and used over the duration of the last three, four, five years. Every time there's an update, uh, we will grab that updated document and load into the software. So you don't need to know. Uh, and then we follow the more stringent, whether it's federal or state, for that supporting documentation. So uh, again, short answer, yes, you're covered uh, in there, regardless was, of practice. Yeah, Bobby, this is Chris. I was just going to add that in that remote assessment, you would have one of our security analysts would be walking you through this entire process and they will review all of the information that you update. And if there's questions, and often there are, there's some additional questions where, you know, here's what you're doing, have you considered this piece of it? And, you know, that's really, really important to be able to make sure that we have a policy that effectively addresses the issue. Absolutely. Good point. All right. Chelsea, any other questions? Sorry about that. I was muted. <laughs> it looks like uh, like we have uh, two more questions here. So if you have any more, please feel free to type them in. Uh, can we do our own security risk assessment? So yes, you can. Um, matter of fact, I'll, I'll cite a case this morning. <laughs> this is funny. This is the opposite of what I just mentioned. The the wife is the physician, and the husband was playing the IT role, office manager. Uh, you know, had a very good conversation with him, um, but he was considering doing his own assessment. Yesteryear, you would have been able to do that using the SRAT tool, and he was a very intelligent uh, gentleman. Uh, it's like buying a manual, you know, HIPAA security risk analysis for dummies and going through this big, long, laborious process. A at the end of our phone call, he, he said, you know what, I, I don't know why I would waste my time educating myself on these areas and also considering that the SRAT tool is not updated with the 880 security updates and 708 privacy updates, and I don't know that they have any intention to update that, what we're calling free uh, software. Um, he says it doesn't make sense to do that, and for the cost of what you guys can get this for, it's it's very minimal relative to that. So, uh, my counsel, again, a blunt answer: No, you don't have to use a third party, and you do not have to use a software. Um, but you need to know how to identify what is a high risk. You've got to run every question through a threat matrix, and are you hitting every question from a physical, administrative, 
and technical safeguard. Then you've got to do remediation and get a spreadsheet and, and make sure you map all of that out, who's assigned to what task, and track that. And then you've also got to write a uh, report uh, to submit to OCR following you know, uh, NIST guidelines, OCR audit protocol, and, and make sure you understand what those are uh, before you submit that. And, and so, again, if, if you're one of those people I asked earlier that said, when I grow up, I want to understand HIPAA inside and out, you're a, <laughs> you're a rare breed, and I applaud you. Um, but yes, you can do it, and we've seen people do that with the tool, but uh, the SRAT tool, but it is now obsolete, and you are using an old audit protocol that will not help you pass with the current regulations. So that that is a brilliant question, whoever asked that, and uh, I'd be very, very careful trying to navigate through this on my own, especially the time that you'll invest doing this. It's easier to, to use the automated software. Great, thank you. Next question. I apologize if this was addressed in the webinar. I was interrupted at one point. What percentage of your clients pass their audit? This is Steve. I can take this one. Uh, so far, knock on wood, 100%. Uh, we have uh, had, uh, it, it used to be when, when one of our clients was audited, it started a few years ago that we would have trouble sleeping at night and, and then we would all be cheering when we got the letter from Figliosi saying that they passed. Uh, obviously because we want to make sure that they do. Uh, and we've had several OCR audits as well from some other of our clients. And so far, again, knock on wood, 100%. In fact, we're uh, using HIPAA 1 and Itentive. Uh, the HIPAA 1 software does provide a guarantee of compliance and passing that audit as long as you, you know, do the risk analysis in good faith and you update uh, those remediation items uh, per the schedule as uh, as stated, so short answer is 100%. I don't think we said that before in the in the webinar. So in your interruption, you didn't miss anything. Well, and and I will add to what Steve just said because he won't share this with you, but because uh, they're they're too humble. We have some of the best auditors in the nation. They have done audits for very very large health plans that are uh, you know constantly under the scrutiny of federal regulations. Um, and again, 100% pass rates, helping these folks get from where they are to uh, compliant. We've got uh, counties, cities, uh, governmental institutions, universities, health information exchanges. I mean, those are some of the larger clients we have. And then, as I mentioned, thousands of uh, smaller providers that are just trying to, you know, provide a good service, eke out a living, and and have now been thrown into this compliance. Um, you know what they perceive as a compliance nightmare. So they're very aware of of your needs and the stresses that are associated with this, and very good, uh, especially the attentive side in helping you guys really walk down uh, this process. And so again, you've got a very very good uh, combination with attentive and HIP one software supporting you through this. Great, thanks guys. And at the moment it looks like we're on to our last question, uh, but we'll stay on as long as people keep asking questions, so feel free to hang around. Uh, what is Itenev's value add to HIPAA 1? I, I would say uh, the big value add is they understand your needs, and there are some services that they provide that we don't. Um, as a managed uh, services organization, we, we help identify the gaps, and, and that's where we start and end. So if, if you were to call us directly, uh, first of all, our price would be a little bit more expensive than going directly through iTentive. So that's one bonus, just, just the cost savings. The second is once we identify those gaps, uh, HIPAA 1 is, is solely focused on providing the best automated software in the nation. We don't engage with a lot of the remediation items that need to be uh, completed and some of these security gaps and compliance gaps. That's where uh, Itentive steps in and helps uh, fill that role after those gaps are identified, if that makes sense. So it is a great uh, partnership. We do this with several uh, you know, groups across the nation, regional and national, and, and it seems to be the best fit in helping you guys get uh, from where you are today and where you're required to be by law and also just from a personal perspective they'll be able to help navigate through this um, 
you know, process and provide best practices for your organization a lot quicker than you could do it on your own. In, in addition, I would add that you know we've been we've been working with NextGen and using NextGen since the mid '90s. It's a very complicated program with a lot of different different pieces to it, and we really understand the security components and what's expected and how you need to use that application to be able to to further your HIPAA. Um, compliance, and then we we are we are perfect resources for that. Um, in addition, from a from just to echo what Bobby was saying, we do have some additional tools that once we've decided that we're doing things a certain way, we can have some other automated tools that can go through your environment and kind of measure to see how well you are at, at being able to deploy anti antivirus, for an example, or anything else onto your systems, and be able to not only say, "Yep, we have a policy procedure," but we've also done some scans in our environment to be able to show that we absolutely are doing what we say we're doing. Okay, great. Well, it looks like we're at the end of all of our questions, but if anybody has any more, please feel free to reach out to Chris to see his information on the screen. Uh, you can reach out to me. I'll be sending out an email next week with a link to the recording as well as to the um, assessment that you can take. So I'll be doing that next week. So if you have questions, you can always reply to that. Uh, you can interact with us on social media. You can reach us a number of ways, and we'll, we'll feel free or we'll be happy to help you through through any of those channels. So thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Thank you. Kelsey. It's been a pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.